Hi. Don't let yourself be misled by the surroundings. This is not yet another drum video. There are so many great drum videos out there, so I would have found absolutely no point making my version on rudiments, linear drum beats uh, or similar, especially because I don't think of myself as a drummer who would make the world any better by showing off his chops. So instead of that, we'll focus on something much less broadly discussed in the drummer community, and that's the use of electronics and sequencing software in a drum kit. Today, when they sell way more electronic drum kits than acoustic, I still see that drummers are somewhat intimidated by electronics, which is a pity because drummers are the first ones to be told by their band leaders before going to the studio that you don't need to come and play, we'll manage with a groove library. And this is exactly why drummers should be aware of all the technologies which other musicians use for drums and maybe even strike back and take electronic drumming to a further level and uh, do some of the things which you'd normally expect from other band members or even DJs. One of my all-time favorite drummers, Lenny White, told me in an interview that I made with him some years ago that when the Lindrum appeared in the early 80s, you know, that was one of the first commercially available sample-based drum machines, he thought Wow, this thing will leave me with no work. So he decided to learn how to use it. So he'd still get a call if they wanted to create a rhythm track with a Lindrum. And I think he was totally right. And that's how all drummers should approach new technologies. This video is not a full-length tutorial covering all topics I normally like to discuss at clinics, such as creating drum loops, sampling techniques, basics of synthesis, uh, triggering acoustic drums, and many more. This is just a short introduction uh, that gives you an idea on how this dream setup around me works and show the most important features that make it really unique and an enormous fun to play. Becoming a little familiar with what this system can do will also help you to understand what's going on on stage during my solo performance, Andre E. Nerd and uh, this will probably make the show even more fun to watch. Although we are in a studio, this is my stage setup. So the outputs of my own stage mixer here are patched straight into the recorder behind me. So this is pretty close to what the audience would hear at a gig. I've always been interested in using electronics in my acoustic drum kit. And uh, like for most drummers, it started with simply triggering some samples and uh, sound effects. But later I wanted to do something more complex and uh, try to take full control of electronics without sacrificing the musical freedom and uh, spontaneity. So I wanted to have a setup where I have interactive communication with the sequencer while playing the drums. There's always been a problem with taking sequencers on stage in improvised music. And it was a great leap forward when Ableton Live appeared and uh, took the interactivity between musicians and computers to a further level. But even live has its limitations, which make it difficult to take full control of it while playing an instrument. So in many bands, you see a DJ or someone who deals with the computers only. Unfortunately, uh, most software were not designed with drummers in mind. And we had to do some serious development to come up with the system I needed. One might wonder uh, what I mean exactly by saying not designed with drummers in mind. Uh, so you might ask the question, what makes drummers so special so that they need special tools? By my view, there are two crucial differences to other instrumentalists and DJs. One is that while playing the drum kit, we're like Captain Hook or, or Edward Scissorhands and have no free fingers to type on a computer keyboard or touch some delicate knobs and faders. And even more, normally we don't even have a free limb to stomp on a foot controller either. So our only way to communicate with the outside world is to hit things uh, with a drumstick, which is not really welcomed by most objects, especially not the hardware controllers you can buy for your audio software. <laughs> The other difference between us and other instrumentalists is that drumming is about now. 
uh, more than any other instrument. Uh, we're certainly not like DJs who can peacefully listen to what's coming next, then check their emails, play some computer games while waiting for the changes to become audible to the audience. We expect instant response to whatever we do on a drum kit. And unfortunately, most software were not designed like that. And this was our biggest challenge while creating this setup. The development took nearly two years uh, because of all the dead ends and pitfalls we had to tackle. But now, although I would never say it's ready, it's definitely capable of uh, doing most of the things I needed. The setup has some custom built and customized hardware pieces and some software components. Although the most important ones are definitely the software bits, we'll go through the hardware too. I use three of these heavily modified Alesis control pads. One of the modifications was that the onboard pad to MIDI converter can optionally be bypassed. And uh, here is a 25 pin D sub socket for the individual analog unprocessed trigger outputs. The other modification is really plain to see. We installed two LEDs for each pad and an onboard circuitry to control them via MIDI. The need for these uh, LEDs arose when I realized how hard it was to memorize a setup without having any visual feedback. It's absolutely vital to remember what a pad does in a specific setup, as every pad can have a number of totally different functions, like triggering individual samples, starting drum loops, uh, controlling the mixer, controlling the playback transport, or even changing the parameters of an effects processor. And these assignments might change even within the same tune. And messing that up can have a much more dramatic effect than just simply hitting the wrong note on a piano. So I programmed these LEDs to indicate which pads belong together and have a similar function. Like for example here, these four pads trigger individual samples and these three out of the top four control the playback transport. And once you get familiar with the meaning of these lights and set them up properly for every scene, things become a lot easier on stage with these pads. These three custom-built pads are the main drum pads I use in my acoustic kit. They consist of eight small pads and they have no onboard electronics. They only have this D-sub socket for the individual trigger outputs. Unfortunately, we are too busy to install the LEDs, but we'll do that as soon as we can. They were designed to survive the end of the world, so they are at least 10 kilos and they're really nice to play because you can feel how solid they are and they don't pick up the vibrations transmitted by the drum rack they're mounted on but apart from that they're perfectly ordinary normal drum pads these three pads here are the only ones in my electronics setup which have a dedicated function that doesn't change throughout the whole life set i call them the scene launch pads because that's what they do the rightmost one always triggers the next scene, the leftmost one always triggers the previous scene, and the one in the middle always re-triggers the currently playing scene. If you're not familiar with the Ableton Live terms, a scene is a set of samples that belong together. Typically, you can think of this as a part of a song, like an intro, a verse, or a chorus. They all have their own bass line, their own vocal samples, their own synth pad, whatever. And when you launch a scene, all the clips that make up that part will start playing back automatically. Beside the three kinds of drum pads I've just showed, I also use a fourth type of triggering source and that's the acoustic kit itself. Formerly, I used all sorts of triggers on the, on the acoustic drums in conjunction with the traditional mics until I found something really special that takes care of both miking and triggering. These contact mics are called Uko and they're produced by a Finnish company named B-Band and they have several advantages over traditional mics. I took apart a tom from another kit of mine so that I could show you how they work. The mic itself is this ribbon which is attached to the drum shell near the drum head and this is connected to this cute little preamp which is permanently mounted on the drum shell at the vent hole. 
It also has a standard XLR connector. So once installed, drum miking only takes to plug the cables into the stage box and that's it. No more hassle with setting up mic stands or clamps and <clears throat> no more mics in the way to get knocked down accidentally, which is really great, especially in a very tight setup like mine. But beside the comfort that hasn't been seen before, Uko also offers two unparalleled features that I really love. Since the pickup is stuck to the shell inside the drum, it's nearly completely insensitive to crosstalk. Thanks to this unique isolation, the Uko signal is perfectly suitable for triggering electronics. The mic signal coming to the audio mixer can be fed to the trigger to MIDI converter via the channel inserts or the direct outs, so there is no need to use dedicated drum triggers anymore. Just play the four beat. Bring it on. Nothing but hit. The Uko has a very vivid sound with excellent transient response, which I really love. But I found two limitations while using them. Uh, one was that for some reason Uko on a snare drum produces a sound as if a traditional mic were placed at the snare side of the drum. So the sound is lacking that punch that you hear at the top head. This might be good for certain genres, but uh, there are some situations when you miss that extra punch. The other thing I found was that even Uko cannot bypass the rules of physics. And it tends to produce this typical bucket-like sound, which is a result of the sound reflections inside any cylindrical shape, like a drum shell. I would have expected this phenomenon to be more apparent with the bigger toms. But to my surprise, it's the other way around and only the smallest ones are affected. After some experimenting, I found a solution that was relatively easy to execute and vastly reduced this unwanted side effect. Here is a small tom from my kit. And you hopefully can see this piece of rubber foam mounted vertically inside the shell, which cures the transversal reflections but allows for free vertical movement of the air between the drum heads. And because the rubber foam sheet has a flexible suspension and it doesn't touch the drum shell at all, the acoustic sound of the drum remains unchanged. I also like to add that this technique would work on any internally mounted miking system, as all of them are affected by these unwanted reflections. This unit in the rack next to me is called the Mega Drum. And this is the central hardware piece that collects all trigger signals throughout the whole kit and converts them into MIDI notes. I chose Megadrum because as far as I know, there is no other trigger to MIDI converter in the world that's capable of handling a total of 56 inputs, which is more than enough even for me. Megadrum is very inexpensive and if you have basic soldering skills, you can build your own because there is a downloadable parts list and instructions on the Megadrum website. It also has a very well written computer editor which makes it really easy to program. The MIDI signals from Megadrum either go straight to the computer via USB or go to the audio interface via MIDI. Uh, my choice was to use MIDI in spite of that it's a lot slower than USB but it's much more reliable and most importantly, it can be plugged in and out without having to relaunch the whole sequencer application. So the next stage of the MIDI signal is the MIDI port of my audio interface, which is an RME Fireface 800 in all my setups. 
I chose them for their reliable performance, but I could have used any cheaper interface with very low latency. OK, so once the MIDI signal hits the computer, the rest has to be done by the software. The main sequencing host of my setup is Ableton Live, which is surely the most widely used DAW software on stage. But for me, it took quite a while to make a decision of building a whole system around it. And the reason for this was that it was not designed with drummers in mind. And uh, some of the key features I needed were missing from it until Ableton launched Max for Life, a development environment that finally made it possible for us to develop the plugins I needed for my performances. This is not a live tutorial, so I'm not going to spend time on explaining how Live works, but I'll show how I use it and what our custom plugins do. A quick word about what the features I missed most were. Uh, most people I know use Live on stage with the global quantized value set to one bar and trigger the next clip or next scene during the last bar of the currently playing part. This approach might be good enough for most instrumentalists, but it's certainly not very convenient for drummers. Because during the last bar of song parts, we often play fills, so we have no free limbs to trigger new clips or scenes. And also, as I mentioned earlier, anything we hit on a drum kit reacts instantly. So it feels kind of awkward that you hit something and nothing happens until we get to the next bar. So I wanted to have a solution where everything I do on the drum pads would be instantly executed in my live session. If you're familiar with live, you might think this is no big deal. Setting the quantized value to none would do exactly this, which is right in theory, but uh, wouldn't work in a real life situation. Just consider that all the acoustic parts of a drum kit have zero latency. You get the sound immediately when you hit them. But this is not the case with electronics. Uh, it's not so apparent when you just trigger single samples, but things can get really bad when trying to layer several loops on top of each other. So in certain situations, it's virtually impossible to play a kit where half of the playing surfaces have zero latency and the rest has a slight delay. When you hit a drum pad, the impact of the drumstick virtually immediately creates a trigger signal. But this signal has to go through a number of processing steps before we actually can hear anything. Uh, the first stage is to convert the analog trigger signal to MIDI. This takes a few moments, usually ranging from 1 to 4 milliseconds, depending on the hardware and the settings. As I mentioned, I use a good old MIDI protocol for its stability. Uh, so in my case, this delay must be around 4 milliseconds. Once the MIDI signal hits the computer, it must be determined what that signal will do, whether it will launch a new scene or a clip, uh, will it play a VST instrument, uh, will it perform a mixer control action like uh, soloing or muting a channel, and so on. In my setup, there's a great Max for Life plugin that handles this routing function that I'll show you later. So this step also will increase the latency, and then the sound has to be generated and sent to the output of the audio interface, which again adds some more delay to the signal. So a lot of things must happen before we get any sound and what makes things even worse is that this latency is different for each action type. So the delay of the signal will be different when launching a new scene from the delay when triggering a sound of a VST instrument. And most importantly, we mustn't forget that we're humans, or at least most of us keep trying to be one. Uh, and we play with minor inaccuracies which is a very good thing for getting that signature groove, but it's definitely no good for triggering loops, which in most cases should happen precisely on the beat or on another point of the quantized grid. And this is especially true when you want to layer multiple loops on top of each other. And all these little inaccuracies add up and make the whole texture sound very sloppy. So to sort out these latency and inaccuracy issues, we developed a Max for Life plugin that makes it possible for me to trigger everything instantly without losing sync. So when I trigger a new scene or clip, the playback will start immediately and then the plugin will make up for the latency and will make the playback of the newly launched parts align with the grid. And because we're talking about very tiny inaccuracies in a few milliseconds range, in most cases it's not audible at all when the plugin is in effect and makes these minor adjustments. 
The operation of the plugin is based on a similar technique that's known from software samplers, which only store the initial portion of long samples in the memory, so that the playback could start immediately on hitting a note on a keyboard, and the playback of this initial chunk gives the software enough time to retrieve the rest of the sample from the hard disk and continue the playback from there. This technique makes possible the low latency playback of those huge multi-sampled instruments which don't fit the memory. Similarly to this, my Clip Synchronizer plugin launches the clips immediately without any quantization and after a predefined time a quantized shadow clip will take over the playback. Setting up a live set for the plugin is quite complex, so we have no time to go through all the steps now, but the plugin itself has only one adjustable parameter. This value tells the plugin how long it should take to make the playback aligned with the grid. So for example, setting this value to one quarter means that the playback will get quantized in one quarter after launching the clip or the scene. Okay, let's see how it works. I'll start a loop and will re-trigger it on the first beat of the bar a couple of times to show the normal operation of the plugin when you'll hear hardly any noticeable changes. And then we'll gradually increase the delay of the triggering and you'll hear that the plugin will have a more and more dramatic effect until I'll trigger too late and the loop will be quantized to the second beat of the bar. That's it. At first, it may not sound too spectacular, but if you give it a second thought, then you'll probably realize that this little tool is actually priceless. Uh, I'm sure if a live user fully understands the impact of this plugin on controlling live, would want to get a copy of it immediately. Uh, this plugin is switched on all the time and applies to most clips in my set. Uh, but if a track name starts with a star sign, uh, the clips on that track will bypass the plugin which can be useful in some cases. So this is the most important plugin I use, but there are some more very useful ones here. There's a plugin that makes it really easy to program what the trumpets do in a specific live scene. If you have a pad to MIDI converter, you know that you can assign a MIDI node to every pad, and these assignments can be saved in setups or kits, which can then be recalled so that when there is a song where this pad plays a vocal effect and this one plays a brass section fall and then a new song comes when the same pads are expected to do something totally different the new assignments can be recalled by a single command but because the same pads can be used to control more than one thing during the performance their programming can get excessively complex and very hard to maintain uh, across multiple devices for example when this pad triggers a clip at note number 60 on channel 1, this MIDI note and channel has to match the remote command assignment of the desired clip in Ableton Live. But when 10 seconds later I launch a new scene and the same pad has to play a VST instrument, its MIDI note and channel has to get changed to, let's say, note number 72 on channel 2 in order to match the VST instrument's channel and the sample's note number. So the pad to MIDI converter setup changes always have to be in sync with the currently playing scene, otherwise the pads might do something that belongs to a totally different part of the set. So to keep things nice and tidy, I decided to leave the pad to MIDI converter alone and use a single setup for the whole performance and make all MIDI note assignment changes internally in live. And this is handled by this plugin. It collects all incoming MIDI notes and translates them into other MIDI notes which correspond to the currently playing scene within the live set. So this makes sure that the right note assignments will always be recalled at the right time and that all setups will be stored in the live set. These two fields show the incoming MIDI notes and the two fields below them show the outgoing notes generated by the plugin. There are four operating modes. Block mode means that the incoming notes will get swallowed so there is no outgoing note. Cycle mode is the most common operating mode. The root note is the first outgoing note that the plugin will generate for the selected incoming note. 
the steps parameter sets the number of adjacent nodes to cycle through with the outgoing node. So for example, if it's set to one, the root node will be the only ah, outgoing ah, node. Ah, 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 ah. Setting it to two will cause the plugin to alternate between the root node and one semitone above it. Rocking in stereo. Rocking in stereo. Rocking in stereo. Setting it to three will tell the plugin to cycle through three notes, the root note and the two semitones above it. Rocking in stereo. Well, well. Rocking in stereo. Well, well. And so on. The note length parameter sets the length of the outgoing notes and the threshold sets the minimum velocity required for an incoming node to activate the plugin. Random mode is similar to cycle mode, but instead of cycling through the specified range of nodes chromatically, in this mode the plugin will randomly pick an outgoing node from the specified range. And finally, in bypass mode the outgoing nodes are always identical to the incoming nodes. When all my pets are set up in the plugin, the kits can be stored and recalled by MIDI program changes. The MIDI clips which transmit the program changes are placed into the right scene, so launching any scene in the whole set will always record the corresponding note assignment for all my drum pads. So these two pads play melodic one-shot samples in one tune. And the same pads in a different tune play loops. Now I move to another tune. Another set of samples. Now I move to the previous tune again. Okay, the next one is a really useful plugin that gives me visual feedback on the currently playing scene and the playback pointer and it also can display some reminders before hit points. So it's as if I had the scores for the whole show but only the current row would be visible which saves me a lot of space and it's always in sync with the playback pointer. The plugin has no adjustable parameters, it only has a reopen window button which does exactly that, it reopens the playback status display. The window layout is very straightforward. On the left side it shows the name of the currently playing scene, the name of the next scene and the name of the previous scene. On the right side there is a time display that shows the playback position in a bars and beats format. Below this section you can see the playback pointer strip. Bars are separated with the green lines and the number of bars represent the length of the current part of the tune. This obviously doesn't mean that all clips must have the same length for that scene. So for example, it's no problem to have a 2 bar loop in an 8 bar verse, but the length of this strip will always represent the length of the song part that's playing back. When I launch a new scene, the display reflects this action and shows the current scene name and length and the playback pointer bar is always in sync with the playback position. Seeing all this information during the performance is really great, but the plugin has some more very useful features. It can highlight the important hit points of song parts and can display messages about them. The highlighted bars are shown in red and the related text message appears at the bottom of the plugin window. I often use this feature and have a very simple scoring method for the messages, which can be easily read by anyone who's a little familiar with step sequencers or drum editors. Dashes represent the empty slots on the quantized grid. This character stands for the bass drum and this is for the snare drum. So for example the readout of this pattern looks like this. 
setting up the plugin is really easy. Just create a guide track with a clip for every scene and insert a plugin into that track. The length of the clips should correspond with the length of the song part they belong to, as this will determine the number of bars shown in the playback display strip. If there are messages you want to display in the bottom row, just type them into the clip's name, start with the number of the bar they should apply to, and separate them with commas and you're ready to go. We had no time to cover all the custom plugins I use in my setup, but these are the most important ones. And if you want to check them out, there are free download links on my website, andre-ener.com. And finally, let's go through the most important building blocks of the tunes that we play at the show. In this piece, I have a number of rhythmic and melodic loops. Some voice samples. Some one shot samples. Some one shot melodies. And for the solo in the middle of the tune, I use these pads which control the finger effect by native instruments. When you hit a pad by itself, it doesn't generate any sound, but if the audio is playing back, it alters the signal.
from a technological point of view, this is an old school tune with some loops and one shot samples, some sound effects and some samples from old documentaries. That's it. This tune features a vocoder line and a vocoder solo. Vocoders have been around for several years, but I don't know of too many drummers who use them. In fact, I only know one person, and that was uh, Tony Verderosa, also known as VFX, who did some really great stuff in the 90s.
These two parallel worlds surround us and we never know when we'll find ourselves on the other side. Uh, they are represented by two sets of loops, a heavenly arpeggiated one and a really nasty ugly one that goes like this. And they literally run in parallel and I can randomly switch over from one to the other. This is the band's favorite tune and I turned it into a, some sort of a martial art exercise for them because they had to be on full alert and react instantly when I switched from heaven to hell and I deliberately didn't give any signal to them, uh, which was uh, great fun for all of us. That's it. This tune is an exception in many ways, because this is the only one that has no pre-recorded building blocks, as all the loops are played on these two Korg wave drums behind me and are recorded on the fly to live, and then we jam over the recorded bits. There are so many great videos on YouTube on how to use live as a looper, so I'm not going to cover that in full detail, but we'll show how my looping setup works. I have an 8x8 matrix of clip slots in my live set where I can freely record to any slot and then launch any recorded clip. I have two foot controllers which are programmed to perform all actions I need to achieve this. I can locate any clip in the matrix. If uh, the slot has a clip, I can launch it. Or if the slot is empty, I can start recording. Thanks to a nice little application called Bohm's MIDI Translator, uh, which can emulate keystrokes on a computer keyboard, I also can perform some actions which you'd normally do by typing. For example, I have an undo pedal to cancel the recording if something goes wrong with it. And I also can control the playback transport. So these are the most important actions I need, and the rest is up to me and the band. I chose eight wave drum sounds for quick access for this tune. Some of them are rhythmic. I also play all the melody clients for this tune.
that's it. So that was pretty much it for now, I hope it was useful. But if you're interested in more technical details on electronic drumming, you can visit my website which is ender-ener.com. Thanks for watching, I hope you'll enjoy the show, see you next time.